particular welcome to all our visitors this morning. And it's wonderful to see Jenny back for the service this morning. Thank you. We'll have morning tea after the service, just at the entrance to the church. So please join us for morning tea and a biscuit after, after the service. The responses are shown on the screen. So your responses are shown in yellow, so please follow the prompts. For those of you who are not familiar with the parking system, we do have a car park across the road and you simply drive in, take a ticket, enter the code 2512 on the way out and uh, if you'd like to have an annual pass, please see the treasurer or you might like to drop five dollars in the parking box. Welcome to our organist, Alan and to our choir conductor Nick and great to see the choir again, thank you. Now, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship and rest in the silence, breathing in the presence of God. light this candle as a reminder that Christ is the light of the world. Come and drink of the water of life. We come knowing our thirst and need are bigger than we realize. Come and redefine who you are and how God can use you. We come knowing how some of the world sees us how we see ourselves 
help us to see how God sees us and invites us to join in the work of the kingdom. Come and see the one who knows everything about us. We come to see the one who knows everything about us and loves us anyway and invites us anyway and it enables us to join in God's kingdom anyway. Come, let us worship God. We have come to worship God. We recognise that God created heaven and earth, the sea and the sky, and all that is in them. This land is holy ground. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather, the first inhabitants of this place. We honour their elders past present and emerging, together with all descendants of this nation for their care of these lands and waters. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Trusting in God's overflowing grace, let us confess our sins. Lord, you know who we are. You know everything we've done. We thirst for things that will never satisfy us. We commit ourselves to things that will never last. We worship things that will never bring salvation. Still you offer us the gift of living water. Still you offer us the gift of eternal life. Forgive us, O oh Lord, and give us this living water so that we may never thirst again. Amen. This is the good news of God's grace. Though we were sinners, Christ died for us. Once we were lost and dead, now Christ has become our life and salvation. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
first great Bible reading this morning is the Gospel reading. And I'm reading from John chapter 4, beginning at verse 5. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sika, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me? A woman of Samaria. Jews do not share things in common with the Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that? living water. Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where the people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and is now here, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship Him. God his spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth the woman said to him i know that messiah is coming who is called christ when he comes he will proclaim all things to us jesus said to her i am he the one who is speaking to you just then his disciples came, they were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want, or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one, one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say, four months more, then comes the harvest, but I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. 
the reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. But here the saying holds true. One sows and another reaps. I send you to reap that for which you did not labour. Others have laboured and you have entered into their labour. Many Samaritans from the city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there for two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Saviour of the world. Our second reading this morning is taken from Romans. Romans chapter 5, reading from verse 1. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have obtained access to his grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still were sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more surely, having been, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the living word. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ.
don't know about you, but I'm thankful that the choir has led us in a prayer as we reflected on the scripture today. And that's a prayer that we continue as we listen together for God's inspiration through my words. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be honouring and acceptable to him. Amen. I know uh, some of you saw me here two weeks ago, but for those of you who weren't here, uh, I'm a chaplain at the Queensland Children's Hospital and sometimes the Martyr Hospitals over at South Brisbane. And as I visit churches, I tell stories of my ministry there as they reflect part of the Bible passages. And, uh, and I do that as a way of giving thanks to the Uniting Church for prioritising that ministry and prioritising the truth that God can be found not just here in a church building, but in the world out there and that um, the church equip and enable some of its ministers, people like me, one of their deacons, to serve in uh, hospital ministry. In a state hospital, chaplains aren't part of the system. Each day we get a list of patients who, as they enter, tick a box to say that they're from a particular religious group and, uh, and we're given permission to visit those patients. It's a bit like, uh, you know, they say, I'm a Uniting Church person, so they give me the Uniting Church list because that I already know that, because they've already told them that. But, um, normally we can only visit people from our own faith group but because there aren't very many United Church children in the hospital, not because uh, God makes us healthier than others, but because there aren't very many children in the United Church. I have the privilege of visiting Christians uh, in the hospital, and I love it. I just love it. And each time I go and knock on the door, I introduce myself. I say, would you like a visit from the chaplain? And the answers are always very different. And to be honest, quite often people say no. Sometimes it might be because they've had no sleep. Sometimes it's because they're exhausted from managing complex situations and complex needs. Sometimes people just need space. Of course, sometimes uh, in a hospital, people are so angry or confused about God, they don't want to give God any space. Other times people are questioning the existence of God or they have their spiritual needs met and covered by their own faith community. I never judge why people say no, or yes for that matter, but I love making the offer. I love knocking on that door and inviting people to intentionally bring the spiritual world into their physical world. Inviting people to explore and experience God who is present with them even when they can't see, hear or understand God. Sometimes when people say no, I walk away from the room with a little bit of the same attitude that Jesus had while he was talking to the woman at the well. If you knew the gifts of God, and who it was that wants to speak to you today, I wonder if you'd make the same response. I wonder what their image and understanding of God is and why they might say no. I confess, sometimes I say the same thing to myself, especially when I choose to veg out and watch Netflix instead of reading scripture or, or reflecting on Christian music. I think, God is trying to break into my world, my issues, and instead I'm going to zone out and think about myself. The story of the woman at the well is an amazing story. It celebrates something of the gentle presence of God, who out of love for us makes himself humble, makes himself vulnerable, so that in our vulnerability we might discover our strength we might discover God present with us. And uh, Jesus in today's passage says, everyone who drinks from the water that I will give will never thirst again. 
But whoever drinks from this water um, will become thirsty, but my water they'll never thirst again, and they'll well up within them a spring of willing, uh, of life-giving water that's eternal life. And the woman says this, So give me that water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw water. You see, one of the most amazing questions that that Bible, Bible passage raises is, why is that woman going to the well in the middle of the day? We live in Queensland. We know. The middle of the day is hot. <laughs> if you were going to go and grab some water from a well that you had to walk a long way to do it, why would you go in the middle of the day? Why wouldn't you go in the early morning or the late afternoon? But the rest of the story gives us a hint. She is a woman who's isolated. She's experiencing rejection and abandonment from her community, maybe even condemnation. For her, the middle of the day is a safe time to go to the well. For her, the middle of the day is the time when she's not expecting to run into anybody else. She won't have to look at the glances from others who are making assumptions about her and uh, the, who might question why she's had so many uh, marriages and why the person she's with now she's not even married to. In that patriarchal society in which she lived, people might be wondering not only how were men using her, but how was she using men? And when she asked the question of Jesus, um, why would you, a Jew, ask water of a, a Samaritan woman like me? She's not only asking that question, she's asking deeper questions about what do you want from me? How are you going to use me? How might you misuse me? And why are you talking to me at all? Because most of the men who talk to me are only after what I can give them. Are you just the same as them? But Jesus, in his gentle response, says to her, not only does he know her, not only does he know about her, but Jesus is connecting with her and inviting her to discover more about herself, more about who she is and about how God can use her. One of the things about being a chaplain in a state hospital is that when you go and knock on a door, you never quite know what you're going to get when you get to the other side. Maybe the person is sick or maybe they've got an injury. Maybe they're struggling with a condition that's terminal. Or maybe the biggest issues in that room aren't medical at all. Maybe they're financial. Maybe they're issues about child protection or legal matters. And that being in hospital is just part of the consequence of that. One of the things that helps me knock on the door, even when I don't know what's on the other side, even when I'm not even concerned about what it is, because regardless of what it is, It can't be bigger than the grace of God. It's not larger than what God has already done for them in Christ on the cross. No matter what's happened in their past to lead them to that situation, the grace and love of God that God invites me to offer is there as a spring of life giving water and hope. While the grace of God is the same for I me, mean, no matter who's there, what is different is how people react or respond to whatever issues they're carrying, whatever circumstances they find themselves in. Paul in our Romans reading today says, And we boast about the hope and glory of God, not only so, but we also glory in our suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance. 
perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us or put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Some people go through suffering and it's true, they're made stronger and their faith in God is made stronger. While for other people, the same event or a different event crushes them and somehow or other they seem to be frozen in time. Acutely aware of their vulnerability and their faith in God diminishes and their sense of life and purpose diminish with it. Have you ever had someone tell you, oh, I know what you're going through. I know what it's like and I'm really sorry. And in the back of your mind, you're thinking to yourself underneath a polite smile, you have no idea. You have no idea what I'm going through. When we first hear those words of Paul, we may think that Paul has no idea about what we're going through. And in a way he's right, because Paul lived in a time and a culture that didn't have the internet, that didn't have a level of financial stress, that didn't have the world travelling at the pace that we're travelling. And Paul's not assuming to have any idea about what we're going through. But for a moment, let's just reflect on what Paul himself was going through. You see, Paul was a person who had a lot of authority. He had a lot of status, a lot of money, and a lot of people looked up to him. He had a lot of respect. But with his conversion to Jesus, to Christianity, with his encounter with Christ, he went from being stable to being transient and sort of homeless. He went from having this stable income to relying on the generosity of Jesus' followers to keep him fed and keep his ministry going. He went from being somebody who exercised authority and power in the community to somebody who was regularly whipped and beaten and whose life itself was under threat. Recorded at least six times in the uh, book of Acts that his life, uh, people tried to kill him. So in these words, Paul isn't saying to us he knows what it's like, but he is saying he knows what it's like to go through challenges. And he knows what it is to go through challenges in a way that strengthens us. Why? Because he knew who God was. He had an accurate understanding of the nature, presence and power of God and understanding that enabled him to feel blessed, to feel alive and to feel safe regardless of what else goes on. Paul continued to bless the poor and vulnerable, even though he once considered them to be impure. But Paul's actions didn't only challenge other religious leaders, they challenged the political and cultural leaders of the time. And that's part of the reason why he was considered an outsider. Both Jews and non-Jews, religious and cultural leaders, all wanted him left, all wanted him dead. So when Paul makes this statement about we boast in our afflictions because our afflictions produce endurance and with endurance character and with character hope, he's not describing some linear journey that might be how you get from here to the train station and how you get from train station home from here to the car park and how the best way to drive home. He's describing a journey that's a little bit more like Elizabeth 
Kubler-Ross's journey about the process of grief. This is a journey that's a backwards and forwards, onward going, always forward looking, but constantly going back over the past, renewing the evidence and moving forward. It's a story that says if we understand God's love and God's presence with us in Jesus, then we will know how to receive that love and how to move forward. When Jesus is talking to the woman at the well, part of what he's saying is, do you know that God is the God who created life? Do you know that I am the one that God has sent in order that you might discover the truth about God? Do you understand that the God that we worship is a God who takes on pain and suffering upon himself rather than one who chooses to inflict it on you? When we understand who God is and the life that we offer, that helps us endure whatever it is that we go through, whatever it is that life is throwing to us. So let us then for a moment return to the woman at the well. The amazing thing is that Jesus shows her that he, only, he doesn't only know about her, but he knows her. He knows what others think about her and he knows what she thinks about herself. But Jesus also knows what God thinks about her. She is God's beloved child. She is God's daughter who is worth coming for, who's worth staying for, and who's worth dying for. He knows that. And that's why Jesus is connecting with her. That's why Jesus is inviting her into a relationship and encouraging her to see herself differently, to offer who she is with Jesus. That's why Jesus is offering herself. You see, after connecting with Jesus, or maybe because she connected with Jesus, she goes from being isolated to being at a well by herself in the middle of the day to going back into her community and having the courage to talk with people. She goes from being condemned as an outsider to one who begins to experience care from her community. She goes from being considered religiously impure to one who is discerning the presence, power and love of God. She goes from being an outsider to being a leader in her community by the grace of God. I want to tell you a story about somebody I met last week. I knocked on the door, I opened it and introduced myself and I was a bit surprised to see a dog on the bed. And so even though the family had indicated that they didn't really want to see a chaplain, I went in and patted the dog and thanked them for the visit. I blessed them on their way and then left. So the mum said to her 16-year-old son, tell Jenny why you've got a dog here. And he said, um, it's because I'm blind uh, and I need one to see the dog. I said, okay, thanks. Introduce Sadie and then I left. Well, this young man is a member of the United Church and as has been my practice, particularly when there's members of the Uniting Church in hospital, regardless of whether or not they want to see me, I commit to spending 10 to 15 minutes praying for them and praying about them and asking God's blessing upon them. And so I did that, and as I did that, I sensed God saying to me, tell Ollie not to identify himself as a blind person because I have given him vision and insight and the gift of leadership. Okay, I thought to myself, 
went home, went to bed, continued to pray about it, woke up early the next morning and that thought didn't leave me. So I knocked on the door. I opened it. And instead of asking whether they wanted to see a chaplain, I said, Hi, Ali, I met you yesterday. I'm the chaplain. And I went away and prayed about you. And I just want to know, would you like to hear what happened when I prayed? And he said, yes. So I came in and I sat down. <laughs> and my heart was pounding. And I thought, now before I tell you, God has a message for me to give you. I want to give you some advice. And to be honest, I actually think it's advice, advice I learned here from that pulpit. And it was when somebody tells you they had a word of God from you, your response should be maybe. Always maybe. Always question it. Always discern for yourself if it's God's word to you or not. Don't just allow somebody else to speak it. So I said, I wanted to tell him that, but then I, and he said, okay, but he still wanted to hear what I wanted to say. So I said, I wanted to tell him that I sensed that God was saying uh, that to encourage him to define himself by how God sees him. That he was a, a young person with vision and insight and a call to leadership. And his mum again said, go on, Ollie, tell Jenny. Go on, go and tell Jenny. I'm thinking to myself, what's he going to tell me? Uh, but anyway, he says, well, I represent Australia in two sports, he says. He's the batter for an Australian blind cricket team. He's got only between 1 and 5%. Uh, he only has vision in his left eye because he lost his right eye to glaucoma. And his left eye, he has Peter's anomaly over his right eye, which clouds his vision, his cornea. And the second sport he represents Australia in is goalball, which I'm no athlete. But I think it's like, go on Google it, I don't want to get it wrong on the internet, but I think it's like a, a blind person sort of soccer thing. Anyway, and, uh, and his mum indicates that he's been long listed for the Paralympics. And I say, that's amazing, that's really good. Um, I won't go to Paris to see you, but if you still, if you, um, you know, join the Paralympics here in Brisbane. I live at the Gabba, so I'll cross the road, pop over and see you uh, if I can. Uh, I thought to myself, and I said to him, well, I don't know how you're going to represent Australia on the sports field, but I think your biggest contribution to the game might be in the leadership that you play. In how you play in the as a team member or as a leader. And we talked throughout the week about how that might be or how we might uh, represent God. I had a number of visits with Ollie that week. And Sadie and his mum Melissa. And I could clearly continue to see the leadership potential in this young man, in his outlook and his faith. But to be honest, every time his mum spoke, she reminded me of Jesus as well. Her gentle encouragement, her loving presence, her vision for Ollie beyond himself. In fact, she herself is an amazing woman who could also be Googled, who before he was born had done research and a doctorate on uh, vision impairment. I want to invite you to join with me to continuing to pray for Oliver Fanshawe, or Ollie as he's like to be known, that he might achieve his dreams and visions for his life. I want to invite you 
to join with me in giving thanks that although Ollie is vision impaired, in the country in which he lives, he can still participate in society. He can still achieve goals and he can still show leadership. And I want to invite you to pray with me that just as the wider society can be blind to the needs of others, be they children, vision impairment, disability, uh, gender different, uh, domestic violence, homeless people, we can all be blind to them, but may we never be blind to the God who lives in them and may we be people who call out God's grace into our society so that all might be um, included. You see, it's not just Ollie who goes to church to meet Jesus, to do at uh, what the woman at the well did, go there to drink deeply of the unconditional love of God, of the grace of God that's already saved us. This is a place where we come. This is a place where we seek to hear God's voice to us. This is a place where we hear again the joy and challenge that God knows each one of us. That God knows us by name. And that God has an invitation for us to join him in this. So as we reflect on the story of the woman of the well, or on Paul's experience of resurrection and how that helped him overcome his own hardships and difficulties, as we hear again the story of Ollie and this experience of inclusion of hope and of faith, may you hear your own encounter with Jesus. May you have heard God's words of comfort and care for you. May you experience his call on your life. May you know he hears your questions, your faith, and share that experience with others. In the remainder of worship, in your response to God's grace to you, may you offer to God all that you are and all that you have, but allow God to offer you a life still yet beyond what you can imagine for yourself. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you that you heard the word and need of humanity and you came yourself in Jesus. Thank you that you didn't just wait at the well for that woman, but you wait for each one of us. Awaken us by your spirit to be attuned to your life and your blessing that we may never doubt how much you love us, that we may hear again all that you have done for us and that we may receive again your call to be more with you than we can be alone, individually, as a family or as a church. Give us that living water, that may never run dry. Amen. In response to all that God has done for us, can I invite you to stand and sing with me in heavenly love.
she never would have discovered her true value and purpose. And she could not have offered to God and to others more of herself. As we see it in God's life-giving word and life-giving love for us, let us consider what it means to drink from this living water for justice, for hope and for peace. As we consider our response to God in our home, at work, and at church, and in our community, let us consider how our life changes with Jesus. Let us prepare ourselves for our offering and give to God our questions, our time, our monies, and our hopes. Our free will offerings will now be received. But in your hands, they can change the world. Receive this money. Receive this church, this community of people and our very lives. Thank you for the way that you change the world yourself and that you invite us to change it. each pray our own prayers to God, but let us now claim the privilege to pray in the company of others as we lay before God our concerns and listen for God's response that we might detect our individual future missions. I invite you now to join with me in prayer. The Goddess, we think on the meeting of Jesus with the Samaritan woman we pray that in our world today there will be better understanding and empathy between people of different ethnic backgrounds, cultures and beliefs. In our Australia today, give us the foresight to accept the refugee and the empathy to embrace migrants, many of whom have come from suffering in their original homelands. We pray for our Aboriginal sisters and brothers. We pray for greater understanding of the problems and the possible solutions as we endeavour to right previous wrongs and effect reconciliation with our First Nations people.
we center our thoughts upon those people in our society who neglect their spiritual well-being. May they see the need to connect with their God and attend to the spiritual aspects of their lives. We pray for the various denominations of the Christian Church that united in our outreach we will not be shallow and opportunistic in our message, but offer people hope, love, and a sincere invitation to join in a pilgrimage of faith. We pray for those in the world who are in the midst of great disorder and suffering as a result of war and natural disasters. O oh God, there are horrors in the world today beyond our comprehension. In Turkey and Syria alone, five million people needing help in below freezing temperatures and 8,000 dead. woman at the well prompts us to remember that we take so much for granted and that water for instance a basic need we each have is not easily available to some people in the world may we be thankful for those things that we take for granted and oh God we pray for the provision of essentials to those who hunger and thirst in our world today This morning we give thanks for the Reverend Jenny Bush and we thank you for your support to her as she ministers to and supports six children and their families. May she be given strength, courage and wisdom in her important outreach as she becomes your presence to those in need. We give thanks for Reverend Susan and all who work to make this an effective corner of the kingdom of God. Give this congregation wisdom and insight that we might be effective in our outreach and always be your presence in this city. Pray for individual members of our congregation who are presently going through illness, stress or grief. Enfold them with the comfort that only divine presence can provide. Finally, as we sit together and we pray together, may we each individually pray for those in our lives who are closest to us, that you, O oh God, will keep them safe, fulfilled and happy. And as a sign of sacred unity, we join together in the Our Father. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Being in the presence of Jesus changes us. Understanding that God is with us and loves us no matter what lightens us. Understanding whatever we carry and we don't carry it alone fills us with hope. And so I want to invite you, having experienced something of the grace and peace of God, to now share that peace with one another in a COVID safe, respectful way that you normally do here. <laughs> peace of the Lord be with you. gives us a future, daring us to go. Thank mm-hmm. you.